In the following couple of minutes, I would like to set out how marine spatial planning can be conducted and how it has been conducted in recent decades. Of course, this will be far from a comprehensive account, but I rather aim at sketching the potential of marine spatial planning as a contribution to more sustainable ocean management. What is marine spatial planning? The UNESCO defines marine spatial planning as a public process of analyzing and allocating the spatial and temporal distribution of human activities in marine areas to achieve ecological, economic and social objectives that are usually specified through a political process. This is currently the most widely accepted definition, although you see there are lots of uncertainties and uh, unclear uh, terms in there. First and foremost, this definition makes clear that marine spatial planning is a process. So it's not just a tool, you don't just open your toolbox and say, look, let's apply marine spatial planning. It's a process and it's not static. This also means that many changes can occur, occur during the planning stages and also that the final plan itself is actually not fixed for time uh, immemorial but is, must be adapted to ongoing changes. Secondly, the plan should be applied to a particular area over a particular period of time and the definition we've heard about the uh, temporal elements as well. In other words, both the spatial and temporal scope of the plan need to be defined beforehand. You need to know what you're doing, what you're starting the process for. At this point, it's useful to note that where terrestrial spatial planning is rather two-dimensional, marine spatial planning is by definition three-dimensional because you have the depth of the water and the seabed. The particular area where the plan is applicable could be strictly geographic. But to what extent should you involve the coastal region in the plan? In many cases, it would make sense to follow the boundaries of the ecological system. And even strictly geographic boundaries might not be clear. Importantly, humans can only manage their interactions with the ecological system and not the ecological system itself. The latter is not possible since humans are part of that very system themselves. It's about human interaction with ecological systems that we are addressing here. What the Law of the Sea Convention mentions, for example, is the possibility for coastal states to institute traffic separation schemes for shipping. This is a perfect example to be included in the marine spatial planning process. Where should shipping be? Um, how should shipping be regulated to then have other users in the same area without our conflict? So the provisions about uh, coastal states' ability to proclaim safety zones around installations and artificial islands in the exclusive economic zones, another example of a planning process for a specific use. What is so different about marine spatial planning compared with um, traditional approaches? Marine spatial planning tries to take into account many different uses of the ocean. Most forms of marine management before that focused simply on just one activity, just on shipping or just on fishing, on wind farms or tourism but not on all of them together in the same uh, time and geographical space. Even more important, different marine activities are normally managed by different authorities, either on the national level, the federal, the regional, or the local level. These bureaucratic divisions need to be overcome by effectively come up with a holistic spatial plan for the marine environment where you involve all these different authorities. Marine spatial planning might create legal challenges as well because the law is mostly just static and less suited to deal with processes that change over time. Germany managed to implement a plan backed by legislation where Belgium seems to successfully use a marine spatial plan without much legal foundation. So there are different approaches to how you um, make marine spatial planning work within your national legal order. The above does not state that marine spatial planning should be comprehensive. Actually, shipping and naval activities are excluded from the process in many cases, with the argument that these activities are freedom of the high seas and also valid in the exclusive economic zones of other states. In the same direction, to declare a marine protected area does not mean that every activity in that area, fisheries being one of them, is permanently prohibited. There's a whole range of different marine protected areas with different prohibitions both spatially and temporarily. 
The different uses of the seas are virtually unlimited. They reach from tourism, wind farms, fishing, um, recreation to many other uses. And the more one takes into account, the more difficult will it be to have a plan in the end as a result that would be acceptable for the big variety of sectors and the big variety of stakeholders. To reduce the risk of having a plan that is not acceptable, the involvement of stakeholders in the process is uh, essential. It's a key to success of a marine spatial plan. And the earlier, the better. If you involve interest in the first place as early as possible, you may be more successful. So as soon as you know what you are about to plan, you should organize meetings that will collect input from stakeholders. That means you will have to invite fishers, shipping magnets, tourists, hotel managers, the mining industry, sand and gravel extractors, a non-governmental environmental uh, organization, owners of wind parks, local populations, policymakers, the Navy, and many more. A very important group that deserves to be mentioned separately are indigenous people. Their rights in certain areas have been constituted centuries uh, ago. Indigenous people are, in addition, very much attached to their environment, both terrestrial and marine. Moreover, due to this connectedness of an indigenous people with the sea, for example, their knowledge about the marine environment is in many cases unprecedented. So you would also would like to have the knowledge when you plan other uses. Canada, Norway and other Arctic states should be well prepared to involve their indigenous populations in marine spatial planning. To take the marine spatial planning process beyond national jurisdiction involves a whole new dimension. Traditionally only flag states or vessels sailing they have jurisdiction on the high seas and then only of activities related to their vessels. Nonetheless, some regions have ventured into the high seas for marine protection purposes. In the northeastern Atlantic, there is one regional organization responsible for fisheries and one responsible for the protection of the marine environment. And these two organizations have more or less the same application area, which also extends to the high seas. On the initiative of different member states, among them the Netherlands and Portugal, and in cooperation with the International Seabed Authority, which is responsible for the regulation of the deep seabed mining, several marine protected areas have been constituted in areas beyond national jurisdiction. The Sargasso Sea Alliance is another good example of a comprehensive approach towards marine protection that also aims to include areas beyond national jurisdiction. The Sargasso Sea is sometimes called the only sea without a coast, being the part of the Atlantic Ocean that surrounds Bermuda. Assigned by the local government, an international group of experts work to scientifically prove its case for protection of the Sargossa Sea. And a wide array of stakeholders is involved in this process, and initial successes have already been booked. In a nutshell, marine spatial planning highlights compatibilities and conflicts of marine users in a certain space, and tries to uh, accommodate and balance different interests and uses in a um, dynamic way. Marine spatial planning is a process that attempts to reach such a uh, balance with a particular area in a particular time period. To achieve the goals and targets of marine spatial planning and intensive interaction with as much stakeholders as possible is quintessential. 